Is the study of music being ruined by the culture wars? Ian Pace, pianist and musicologist and head of music at City University in London, writes this week that efforts to decolonize the curriculum have gone too far. Ian joins me now. Ian, there's a debate raging in the classical music world at the moment. What is it? Well, there have been a number of recent events which have taken musicology away from just on campuses and has actually been, have actually been reported uh, in the wider media. Um, one of these most recently is uh, the high-profile resignation of uh, a professor at Royal Holloway, University of London, J.P. Harper Scott, on the grounds that he felt that his profession was becoming overly dogmatic and he felt certain sort of political arguments were almost blackmailing scholars in a sense. There has also been a very high profile controversy relating to what would seem very esoteric to some, uh, the analytical work of the Austrian um, music theorist Heinrich Schenker, who also made a, a range of statements and publications which involved you know, what by any accounts are quite extreme racist sentiments and this has led to a whole controversy about whether we should teach Schenker or not, whether he is acceptable, uh, whether his political views, his racial views are somehow mirrored in his analytical work. And there have been other things, particularly in the United States, uh, where some have been arguing against what would be seen as tried and tested and long established scholarly methods uh, for ascertaining truth and veracity, making sure one is scrupulous with sources, uh, uses, uses strong arguments, avoids logical fallacies, does one's homework. With some saying that instead scholarship should be judged on its ability to do good, its ability to sort of contribute to social justice, uh, everything like this, which I would say is a heavy, heavy politicisation of scholarship and is very dangerous in its own way. But these, I would say, are not wholly new phenomena. They've just uh, increased in volume, as it were, in recent years. But they go back uh, several decades to certain, certain movements which uh, began around then, or at least uh, uh, began in a certain direction around there, which I think have led to the current situation that is true in some parts of academia. Mm, well, certainly the debate over art and artists, and I remember, you know, Wagner obviously had some unsavoury views, to say the least, but, you know, people enjoy his music. Do you think that it's now coming to um, a, a point at which people are now thinking more about the, the person that the, and their views rather than the music that they create, that the balance has shifted in that way? Yes, in many ways. And oddly, that's, I would say, in some senses, a reversion to a 19th century approach where there was such a fixation on biography, on mythologies around artists uh, and the link between the biography and the work was seen to be straightforward. I don't think it is straightforward. Uh, what the, there are people who were, you know, really quite despicable people who were very fine artists and there were really nice ones uh, with, with, very, with, with very sort of equitable views who were very mediocre at the same time. Now, there has been a whole range of scholarship looking critically at the relationship between biography and work for all types of artists. This is much more advanced in the field of literary biography than it is in musical biography overall. But I think most of the rigorous scholars uh, would be wary of uh, positing that you can just simply draw a line from one thing to another. An example of this, uh, Arnold Schoenberg in the year 1908, uh, for a period his wife left him for someone else an artist, and that's the same year that his music shifted uh, towards an atonal musical language, a music which lacks the gravitation around a singular pitch which underpins most uh, music in the Western art tradition, uh, one of the most radical directions that's ever happened in music. Now it's very easy to sort of write this off as uh, just a response to a particular event in his life, but I don't think it's anything like so simple as that not least his wife returned to him in time, and, but he still pursued this path for most of the rest of his compositional career. But to respond more directly to your question, I think actually in some ways writing potted biography or writing, writing sort of very informal inferences from, about life and work is much easier than grappling with the very details and the own internal logics of music and I think there are tendencies within musicology and within music education to, to avoid having to put the work in that the latter requires. 
Because by doing the latter, then you can look at how to what to what extent what you can discern about the actual work does uh, relate to the biography, and that's a critical question and something to be re-asked in every single case, in my view. And Ian, it's not just the political views that we're talking about, isn't it? It's, it's also the identities of the composers. You know, you, you might be able to make quite a fair critique that in the West we study a lot about white male composers and not much about people from the rest of the world or other ethnicities and other financial backgrounds, perhaps. Do you think there's something in that that we need to diversify and consider social backgrounds when we're learning about music as well? Well, I certainly think we should be thinking about social backgrounds and the social milieu in which music operated uh, at all times. So how that relates to the actual music, again, I think is a complex and critical question. There's no doubt that the whole history of Western classical music is dominated by white men. I mean, one can argue that uh, for before the 20th century, uh, the number of people who would now be classified outside of Caucasian groups uh, was relatively small, so it's not surprising that you would see a white domination. But the male domination is a wholly different matter. Again, that reflects uh, many other aspects of history, and that's probably true of many other musical traditions in the world. There are extraordinarily important musical traditions coming from China, coming from India, coming from Indonesia, from various places in the Arab world, from various parts of Africa. And the last thing I would ever want to suggest is that these are any less worthy of study and attention than uh, those in the West. And then also sort of folk and vernacular and popular traditions in the West also definitely repay very serious study as well. So I'm not trying to argue for the supremacy of the Western classical tradition, but I do worry about a situation in which that one tradition comes under particular sort of censure uh, compared to others. And whether somehow there's guilt to be associated with uh, having a gravitation towards that, which I think would be seen as very unacceptable if similar arguments were applied to other traditions. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it would be a perversion of the diversity agenda, really. Um, but Ian, let me ask you on, on what you said just now, which is that whether or not the identity of a composer differs, changes, uh, contributes to the music that they made. Do you think, you know, different gender identities or different ethnic identities, composers of those backgrounds, compose different types of music? Can we talk about, you know, female music or male music? Is, is there anything worthy to be said about that? I think those terms and those concepts are very problematic. If I took the example um, with the growth of queer musicology in the end of the 1980s onwards, uh, there were a lot of people quite invested in the idea that there was a gay music and a straight music, and debates raged about was Handel gay as composed to straight Bach, or <laughs> Schubert compared to Beethoven, or Ravel compared to Debussy. I sort of feel that if someone had some information that it was the other way around in any of those cases, they'd probably be able to find some way of arguing that this is reflected in the music. Um, I'm not ruling out there could be some sort of essential identity to what gay composers write, uh, so much as you never find unity amongst an extraordinarily diverse range of figures, uh, but I don't think we're in any position to be able to assert it yet. Um, and, well, the scholar Charles Rosen once said, uh, you might be able to observe general tendencies, but in the case of, he was talking about Schubert, it's the individual case that matters. Um, and how Schubert's uh, music reflected what he may have been same-sex attracted at a time in history when perhaps the concept of being gay did not really exist in the way that it does today. What that means in terms of his music is a very, very complex area to deal with. And I worry that there's a lot of easy platitudes made about this. Uh, there's one musicologist who has argued that uh, the harmony in Schubert's music follows different patterns to those in Beethoven's, uh, less, less suffused with what we call dominant harmonies, which doesn't mean what you would usually mean by dominant, but it simply means, for those who are musicians, it means a chord based on the fifth degree of the scale, um, which is a cornerstone of Beethoven's music and many others. But Schubert takes a somewhat different approach. And this musicologist also observed a similar tendency in Tchaikovsky, who no one doubts the sexuality of him. But then someone else responded that you can also find in between those two figures the same types of harmonic progressions in the work of Franz Liszt, who was about as straight as you would get, and quite a womanizer. So 
linking this to sexuality is you may be able to find some cases to support that argument, but there are often counterexamples as well, and those equally need to be taken on board. Ian Pace, thank you for joining Spectator TV. Mm -hmm.